Okay, let's get started then. Uh, let me make a roll call.
Okay, so now, today I'm going to do mainly review, and we have four weeks of lecture plus the fifth week, and these are all my lecture notes that I have prepared, the PPTs for the first four and five weeks. So let's start with um, lecture three one, which is uh, the third week, lecture number one. Okay, in this lecture, uh, we talked about uh, constitutive relationship. We started out with that in the previous lecture, but essentially we need constitutive relations to solve Kant's equation. You remember the reason why we need constitutive relations in order to solve Kant's equation? Yes, okay. Uh, the more equation is solved, then the Very good, okay. There are four Kant's equations, but only two of the first Two of the four are independent of each other. The first two are the important ones. The third and the fourth vector equations that derive from the first two. So if you look at the first two equations, they are actually four vector unknowns and two equations. Okay, there are four vector unknowns, E, H, B, and P. So you need a constitutive relation to find the relationship between B and H, for instance. And now the one between E and E, and then you write four equations for four unknowns. I think that is the important reason. And so, constitutive relations also uh, define material properties, and they are very important. And simply put, they can be written in this manner for a linear system, only for a linear system, only if P is linearly proportional to E, then you can simplify it in this manner. Okay, and you can think of polarization currents as being due to little dipoles connected to each other N and N on N, and then they can let the displacement current flow to vacuum of space. And you can think of having a series of capacitors connected in space. And no electric current flows to space, but there is a displacement current that flows to space very much like how we can have current going to those uh, series of capacitors we have over there, okay? And these dipoles are usually formed by polar molecules, like water molecules that I showed there. And in general, uh, this is a linear response function. And hence, you can see that in the time domain, it has to be generalized to that of a linear time invariant system. Whereas in the frequency domain, you can say that it can be written in this manner, but in the time domain, you have to think of it as a convolution between the transfer function and the input. Okay, so that's why we have this complicated behavior in the time domain. But in order to make things simple, uh, we go to frequency domain. Everything in the frequency domain or using physical techniques uh, become very simple. Instead of having to write a convolution, you can write everything in terms of product. And that is how we enable ourselves to solve so many complicated electrical engineering circuits. Okay. So you can now generalize yourself to dispersive medium. You can generalize yourself to an isotopic medium uh, that you did the homework on. And then you can even generalize yourself to a conductive medium. In that case, um, in that case, what you have is that uh, you can even put, you can easily put in the conducting current here, sigma e, and then you can run the sigma term together with the first term when you find the complex connectivity. That is, you look at Kessler's equation or Enfield's law in that manner. Enfield's law in the conductive medium is no more different from Enfield's law. The non conductive medium, the mathematically homomorphic system. If you know how to do complex algebra, you know how to solve the second set of equations quite quickly. Okay. And so, 
So sometimes you have non-linear media. In the case of non-linear media, C is not linearly proportional to E. It will be proportional to E to a pi that is dependent on D. And that happens in for instance optic questions. In optical medium, there's something called a curve medium uh, that was detected as early as 1875. And they found that uh, that affects the propagation of optical light uh, through a curve medium. Of course, if you look at magnetic field, and then this here can become non-linear quite easily, and that is of the quite a bit of electrical machinery. This electrical machinery will make things out of uh, uh, magnetic material, and that magnetic material becomes magnified due to the formation of domain. Magnetic domain and those domains make the magnetic medium of the permeability highly non-linear and it's usually dependent on age in this man. Okay. So this is how it looks like and so we, we study away from now and then say, oh, we have mathematical equations now. Uh, in the frequency domain, it's a very simple. We can do all the things that we usually go through. And after you go to the mathematics, you write at, say, the third last line, which is the simple time of wave equation. And then to simplify things, you take a very simple the E is only dependent on C and only pointing in X set direction. Then you have the last equation, which is a very simple one dimensional Helmholtz wave equation. We solve them. We all know how to solve this kind of equation, the ODEs. And then we will solve this equation in the frequency domain. If you solve these equations in the frequency domain, they are also good for conductive medium. They're also good for dispersive medium. So again, you can solve this Helmholtz equations the way you want them, and then you come up with this. Um, in a lossless medium, there is a very nice solution e to the i uh, minus j k dot r. You can define k dot r to be the constant of plane wave front. You write those solutions quite easily. Um, then you can show that E and H and K actually form a right-handed coordinate system. E cross H is always pointing in the K direction. There's something that you should remember to check the solution. You always make sure that E cross H points in the K direction. That also follows from pointing still. So E cross H is the direction of power flow. However, uh, in recent years, there have been some interest in something called the left-handed material. In the left hand of the material, E cross H points in the other direction. Okay, and that happens when very strange things happen. This material is quite easy to write down on paper, but it's quite difficult to implement in the lab. Okay. So, often, if you have such a material, you have something called negative refraction. And there was published a journal article which is equal water and then you put the straw inside the tube, straw banding in off to the Those are all the things that you cannot make those things yet. Okay, but for publicity, you can say you have the negative um, refractive index with all kinds of technologies that you can build on. You can only build a limited subset of those technologies with uh, negative refractive index. So, as I said before, once you have conducted medium, the problem is not any more difficult if you're not afraid of complex algebra. You can make a permittivity complex and everything goes as before. Where now the epsilon under scalar is a complex number. Okay. And we go through this kind of things. Uh, it's all mathematics from this point over. You can define skin depth and that kind of thing. Okay. So let's go to the, I think I'm the end, at the end of the first lecture. Okay, let me see how to move this forward. Let me go to uh, week three, number two, which is this lecture over here.
So we look further in greater detail into the constitutive relationship and see how we can derive those constitutive relationships from first principles. For instance, we studied the group or rent model, and sometimes we also call it a good or rent some of the model. And figure out how we define and derive the expression time. And we can derive this expression chi for a number of media. For instance, uh, for plasma medium, chi can be derived quite easily. In the plasma medium, you assume that the electron is free to roam. The electron is very free. Uh, the electron, the, the atom is essentially ionized. Yeah, I know. Or you have very hot gas. Hot gas becomes plasma. And the electron is not bound to the nuclear. And then you can write down the equation, the equation of motion using using Newton's law. Mass and acceleration is the force. Force is equal to Coulomb force. And then once you have this equation, even though they involve time derivatives, they can be stably solved in the frequency domain. So you use stable technique to solve them. You get a relationship between P, the polarization density, and the electric field. And once you know the polarization density, you can put in the expression for the permittivity. And then the wonderful thing or very strange thing you find is that the permittivity can become negative for a plus one medium. And this refers to a number of natural phenomena. First thing is that if you need to talk to somebody in the outer space. Uh, on the satellite, for instance, you have to send electromagnetic signals to the plasma in the atmosphere. That plasma can bounce that to electromagnetic world. Because when that one is negative, the wave cannot propagate anymore. It's so here that works with some happiness. Okay. Another phenomenon that you have that you do later on in the course is that when that one is negative, we can make the Nanoparticle nano resonance. If you solve the boundary value problem of the nanoparticle excited by the frame wave, you find that amplitude of the nanoparticle field can become very large when you think about one resonance. Okay, we can go into that in greater detail later on. But uh, okay. so this is a very simple model. So that was not good enough because there's no finding for in that model. So we take in a finding for or, or uh, uh, string constant, kappa times x, and put in a finding for or, or kind of thing. And you can see that the equation changes. Instead of having omega square in the denominator, you have an omega naught square. Omega naught square. It's the square of alpha over m. And you can remember from the high school physics that this is just the freshman frequency of a pendulum that comes to a string. Okay, and, and then you can have this kind of thing. And you can also work up the polarization density. And if you happen to take the reference frequency of the string, uh, that polarization density becomes infinitely long. Of course, they not be the same. The, the system that we had written down on the first equation has no law. And that is not weird. Okay. So you can put in law, like put in the law, and that was part of your homework. Um, so, first in the law is proportional to the velocity of the particle. And then the law of friction. And if you look at the second problem in the last equation, that term is actually momentum, like mass times the x dt is momentum. Okay. Gamma, what is gamma? Gamma is a cohesion wave. So if this um, particles are uh, hitting on some lattice or some structure in the material medium, they will lose momentum because of cohesion. And the rate at which momentum is lost is proportional to gamma. So, M and gamma and the X is the rate of momentum loss. Rate of momentum loss is a kind of a force. 
you have to look at the mission to the first form, n times the x the square x to t is also the rate of change of momentum which is accelerated. So because it's collision, it becomes the collision frequency times the momentum. So that gives this question. When you just put in this form, I think I also ask you to use the term to calculate conductivity of the semiconductor material for instance. So all these are statistic proofs. You can actually work things out. Uh, you can use this kind of model, even though it is very simple to describe the last variety of media. And here are some media, but what you need to do is that is to change the mass of the electron for different media. Because if you study classic theory of electronic world waves and elastic, those electronic waves do not behave like an electron increases. Just of the fact that when this electron moves to the lattice, the sister lattice, it is affected by the environment. It moves about as if it has a different mass. This is called effective mass. And here are just a list of effective mass of different electrons, of electrons in different kinds of curves, uh, and due to the lattice constant in different, you know, lattice structure in different. We all have uh, different electron mass. So you can use this kind of very simple, uh, simple minded thing even to describe the last variety of theories, including uh, explaining platonic resonances or why this uh, dog is uh, low, increasing so nicely under light, okay? because of harmonic nanoparticles created in them. And we did this as a homework problem where I asked you to solve for the solution of the nanoparticle and uh, an incident field and changing on the nanoparticle. Look for the dipole response of the nanoparticle. Why is it that we can use electrostatic method to solve this problem? Anybody? We are talking about light waves. We have it is maybe um, blue light in about 500 nanometers. So 500 nanometers is very short. And the frequency is very high. I don't know how to express it in terms of hertz. But many, many hertz. But I only know that the gigahertz, the terahertz, nothing that people can do such anymore. And those are objects to talk about 500 nanometers. 400 nanometers, maybe 3 nanometers. We look up the people with the wavelength to indicate the frequency of the light. Okay. So, if you work with uh, blue light, for instance, you saw 400 nanometers. Now, why is it that you can use the Wavelength is a lot larger than ours. No, no. Okay. The wavelength is a lot larger than the particle size. Okay. The electrostatic theory prevails. Okay. And you have to learn that uh, when you look at Maxwell's equation, you have this, I, I don't have Maxwell's equation here, but you have this uh, time variation on the right hand side. And when the frequency is low, then the wavelength is large. It will drop the D omega to C form, or D to C form, not D omega to C. Let me write this down. That when the when the frequency is low, okay. You can drop terms like this in Maxwell's equation. And dropping terms like this is the same as saying that the wavelength is long. And when can you claim that the wavelength is long? What is the yard that you use? Here is the size of the top. Here is 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 the
but for the size of the minimum particle. Okay, so you cannot use this kind of property for catching off your body, but you can use it for catching off the minimum particle. So we use this as a homework problem, we found that the factor is not the factor, so we use the next one. So as becomes negative, the denominator can become uh, zero and you have a huge plus one breadth. Okay. And then we talk about gyrotropic media. We have lots of homework on this. And this started very fast. So I probably will talk about this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you already learned about this material from the homework. And then about polarization. Well, why is polarization so important? It's important because we need to communicate the satellite in the outer space. And there's something called polarization that's the learning the homework. I mean, the center are linearly polarized microwave in polarization space. By the way, the center of it, the rotation microwave is CT or LHCT, RHCT. Uh, if it's electrically polarized, then you don't have to worry about the weight setting your case as opposed to the iron. So we study this kind of thing quite a bit. And so intersatellite earth communication are done with circularly polarized containers. And we will not learn how to make them now, but later on in sports when we take a you can pick it out to make CPS and CPS and CPS for both transmitters and receivers. And so you learn polarization really well, okay? So that you can talk to engineer when they start designing containers. Um, they have to learn the concepts of axial ratios and kind of thing. Uh, then we talk about power flow for polarization, okay? And, and the interesting thing is that if you have linearly polarized uh, wave, then this power flow tends to be in lumps, form lumps going, uh, flowing through space. But if you have a circularly polarized wave, the power flow is constant, independent of X and T, okay? Somebody was kind of puzzled by that and asked me if that uh, violates energy conservation. No, it doesn't. Let a bullet fly to space as a lump of energy uh, going to space, and no energy conservation is violated. Okay, so this linearly polarized wave uh, flows like bullets to space with no violation of energy conservation. Okay. Let me go to the next one then. The next one should be lecture four. Uh, we talked briefly about CP and how it's been uh, used as a hot topic in optics now. Uh, one of the hot topics in optics is to study uh, angular momentum, uh, spin angular momentum, as well as orbital angular momentum of light. And so light can have both orbital and spin angular momentum. So we went through a brief study of what momentum is. A photon, the light wave carries linear momentum as well as angular momentum because the photon rotates and the angular momentum can be just due to the polarization alone. It can be due to the wave function that rotates with it. Like in that, we call the optic, uh, orbital angular momentum. So then we went and studied complex pointing theorem. Okay, instantaneous pointing theorem we studied before. Uh, in the previous lecture, the instantaneous pointing theorem is that the quantity Talk about what we learn in circuit theory. That in circuit theory, you also have two kinds of power instantaneous power, which is E times T, or V times I, that's a function of time, 
and then you have complex power, which is the base of V times the complex conjugate I. That is called complex power. They can show on paper quite easily that if V of T is sinusoidal or time harmonic, and I of T is also time harmonic, they can fix the time average of the first one. Okay. Find that it's actually equal to the real part of the I complex power. That is so on paper side. Okay, so because of that, then you can easily show that if you have a time harmonic field, you can show this kind of relationship quite easily. That maybe it's easier for me to point. Okay, it's quite easy to show that the time average of this quantity is equal to the half the real part of this quantity. The proof is analogous to this proof. Okay, it's exactly analogous to this proof. So this quantity, which we call complex power, draws our attention and we start this conservative property by taking its divergence. And if you take its divergence, you find that it has a certain nice property. And then uh, we can now uh, find that if we have the previous equation that we had derived previously, okay, the last line, if we take this equation, okay, and look at this last line, and then uh, integrate that equation over a certain volume three, and then apply Gauss divergence. Theorem, then you convert the volume into equation, the perfect integral, and you have this equation that you have. I have taken out the sort of j, I'll give you the j here. And if you look at this equation now, I think it's real part. Real part of this equation has to be the same. The real part of a complex power is what? You know? The real part of a complex power is physically interpreted as. Now, can you say more precisely than that? I think it's still correct, but uh, can you say more precisely? The real part of complex power is what? The average of constant, right? The time average of the instantaneous power. So you take the instantaneous power of a time harmonic signal, you take the average of that, that is equal to this real part of the complex power. So now you can take the real part of this equation, I will get the time average signal that is going into that volume D. Okay. And then if I look at the right hand side. It's almost still invented though, but not quite unless I'm here I convince myself. So if I make new to the information, which is new is equal to new complex on the gate transpose, epsilon is equal to epsilon complex transpose, then you can see from your matrix algebra knowledge. So the right hand side is always the real quantity inside the current system. And the right hand side is some scale. So you take the real part of this equation, the right hand side is zero, and use that there should be no power flow in C D. And that means that that C is lossless. And it's lossless if the subjectivity tensor and the subjectivity tensor are all the missing tensors. Okay. So that is the real part of this equation. Later on, of course, this is double profit movement. We found that for the double profit movement, epsilon central is actually for me. So there's no wrong in the film in the double profit movement that we studied. So that was actually the modulus V. So we study energy density uh, in. Your undergraduate course, you, you learn the energy density to be Z. Okay, that is for vacuum, of course. And then when the medium is dispersed, this chi 
can potentially be a function of frequency. Why is chi a function of frequency? What is a good way of saying why chi is always a function of frequency? Say if, if we are in the electrical engineering, say we have the y omega is equal to the tensor function times x omega. Okay, electrical engineering, they study linear system quite a bit. And then yt in the time domain will be the impulse response convolving with the input. Okay, so for a linear system, why is it that the output does not follow the input instantaneously? Let's go back to your circuit theory, you can have this as a capacitor or resistor or something. Right, the electric components that have to be done to even how the thing we have some kind of production to take. And in a second writing version, there is a inertial force for the left hand side. And it means that it is fixed and the left hand the left hand does not does not have to be changed. And because of inertial force is that it has to be left hand. Similarly, we have the house, doctor, and particular uh with not the response to the Okay. Uh, so because of that, almost all media has to be because it's very hard to find the non dispersive thing. But over narrow bandwidth, you can install non dispersive. But over all bandwidth, it's not possible. So all real media they have to be for has to be dispersive. And one concept they have to do this. Scientists for a while is that they thought that it wasn't an off time, it's just a good for the surface media. So if they use that off time as energy density, they found that it's not how they get computed. You know how to calculate the velocity of a fault, that's the medium. They found that those velocities are energy density, but they be able to power flow. Okay, so that's imagine the power of the media, and if that power is discovered with a good, so you do the loss of it, you get power of all. So you do power of all study, things don't add up. So the energy density formula must be wrong. So we won, went about correcting this thing in the 1960s. And finally, uh, we had a corrected version of energy. Then we, we move on to study uniqueness theorem. Okay, uniqueness theorem ensures that we have only one to be to specify the quantum condition. Otherwise, it would be like uh, the thing you hear in Star Trek, two is the ring of the point. And when you do that, if you learn that the thing is good. Okay, you're not going to be able to do that. So, you need to guarantee only one correct solution. So, let's assume that we have two solutions that are different. Okay, so what we did then was to assume that there are two possible solutions and then come up with an equation for the different solution. One thing to note here is that we have to refer Four equations all driven by forces. 
But the last two equations have no force. So when an equation has no force, what do you call that? Homogeneous solution. Homogeneous solution. And when the solution has no force, what do you call it? Natural solution variable. Another name for natural solution. Depends on the mathematics way of saying it. But what we say is that the solution is very good. Okay? When the system has no guiding force, the guiding force, you have what is what is homogeneous solution, the rational solution, or the natural solution. Okay? You know, it is all actually to the city law. And if that equation has the solution, what do you call it? There is a long way to reach the story. This is community that is a name for the same thing. So, because of this, the last two equations are not positive, which potentially can have non zero solution, which is happening to keep the right name to be at the top. Okay. So, we went through all the mathematics and convinced yourself that. If a different solution is there, how can we make sure that it is zero? There's no difference. So the first thing we did was to convince ourselves when to how to make the left hand side go to zero. How do you make the left hand side go to zero? So the different solution is PA and UE that are the same values in this, A and B that is are the same values in this. The left hand side will be guaranteed to zero. Then you have the right hand side. It's not guaranteed to be zero. You will have a lesson to it. It is you know, the kind of thing you know, I think it's all of you have. And you have to go to the new man. So there are two kind of things you know. You can satisfy the same boundary conditions, but they are still not included in this So the right hand side can be straight, not straight, but right hand side. Okay, I think this is my last slide. Not a fun thing. Let me go to or two. So I just had a brief lecture on uh, uniqueness here. So if you want to make the right hand side to be non-zero, okay, as we say in the previous slide, right hand side may not be zero. If left hand side is zero, right hand side may not be zero still. Why is the reason? Because we can have a rational solution. But this is written in terms of complex power. So in complex power, the energy density has a different sign. There's a minus sign associated with the magnetic field. There is a plus sign associated with the electric field. Well, if you look at the instantaneous quantum field, that's not a bad word. Both of them have the same sign. So, because we are all opposite sign, right hand side can be zero, not because the different solution is zero. But because these two forms can still be cut. And that happens when electric energy is four is equal to magnetic energy is four. And that happens at right hand. So how do we avoid this problem? Well, if it can be avoided, uh, if we make the medium law, so I go back to the isotopic case again. Uh, if you make the medium lossy, you find that um, this problem can be divided into a real part and an imaginary part. Uh, if you were to take the imaginary part of this equation and believe that was what I did, uh, then you end up with the last equation. If you look at the last equation, they have the same sign now. These two terms are the same sign. Loss cannot be all the same sign. What the opposite sign? So one of them for energy cold. So because I have a complex conjugation over epsilon, okay, these two terms are the same time. 
and it's not make up to be zero unless individually they are zero. So in order to make a solution in a cavity, the boundary value problem to be unique, we have to put in some form of the law. Some form of law, and that is how we can get unique solutions when I give an example of an LC tank so again I say all the things you learn about homogeneous solution, natural solution, rational solution, the matrix algebra is translated to an outbreak solution. Okay, you have an equation with the non-zero right hand side. Uh, if the right hand side is zero, when would you still have the solution that is when the matrix thing works? And in linear system theory, um, if you're liking to think in the process, and you like to think in terms of linear systems, think in terms of H of omega and that kind of thing, the lots of system corresponds to an LP tank subject that I have shown there. There's no loss in the system. And it is seen as a transfer function of this system, which is I over D here. That transfer function has sold on the real axis. And then what happens if the transfer function has sold? It would make the definition of the Fourier inverse transform not valid. Can you see that? Say if I were to write this equation, say if my input is uh, uh my my let me see how can I write this. I can write this as h of omega and b of omega is to the i of omega. This is my input in linear system theory. This is my output. This is my transfer function. Okay. So having solved this problem in the frequency domain, you need to go back to the time domain. And to do it rigorously, if you're not a poor man, you have to learn Fourier transform. You have to get I of T by performing a Fourier transform. Um, I forgot, okay? For physicists, we usually use I of omega T. Okay, I of omega, and then this function here would be H of omega T e of omega. So if the transfer function H has poles, and then it will render this Fourier inverse transform not possible. You when you integrate Fourier transform according to the last form, you have to integrate on the real axis. And your integration will collide to the pole. And if you're thinking about it, so you have a special case. That's how you can solve this problem. One way to solve this problem is to introduce a little bit of law into this linear system. If you introduce a little bit of law into this linear system, you can go to that system away. If you go back to the Fourier transform theory, and the Fourier inverse transform becomes well defined, you can integrate very happily on the real axis with no problem of non uniqueness. Okay. Otherwise, if you do a Fourier integral like that, you do not know what to do when you collide with the pole. So what do people do? You can either choose to integrate below the pole or integrate above the pole. Okay, let the control integration be below the pole or be above the pole. And of course, there's non-uniqueness again there because you don't know what to do. Okay. Then if you do it the second case around, you always are sure of what to do. Okay. So then we have the radiation problem that if we have a source 
radiating in vacuum for it. How can we guarantee that the solution is unique? I told you before that with the biggest of process, the solution is not unique. What about a case of having a force radiating in outer space in vacuum? Vacuum is possible. So this is the problem that I have. Uh, assuming that this force is in the bottom C, which is clockwork, and then I equally the boundary from the fabric. Let's think of it as a fabric. This is the reason. And then no, I thought what I told that it's not unique. And then we'll put it in one. So this problem is not unique and it can convince yourself quite easily. And for those who have an undergraduate course in cavity you find that if we just have a rectangular cavity, the cavity most are given by this form over here. There are something cavity, many, many of them. And if you make this cavity bigger and bigger, A, B, and B becomes bigger and bigger. Those cavity modes we can first come up on the middle x to the y. It was the operating every point in the space. There's no frequency that you can choose far away from any of these rational modes. They're almost going to encounter a rational mode, no matter where you operate in the frequency space. Okay. So so I kind of elaborate on this in the last thing. So how do you make the problem unique then? There are two ways you can make the problem unique. It is to put it a little bit of rock. So vacuum has no rock. Vacuum is going to be rock here. You just need a this thing from outer space where the photon has traveled light waves. And then we have to start. Another way of enforcing law. Very good. Okay. Let the signal go out and never come back. And that is called radiation. But you suppose what is called a sum of your radiation condition. So sum of your radiation condition says that if you solve this problem. So assuming that the wave goes out in the world to come back. That system will become a lot. So we make this problem that we make the reason by using the form of the reason. So this is important to be in one of the different parts. So you better know this concept more. Let me talk about uh, reciprocity. Okay, reciprocity uh, is actually in many people's culture. Okay, and, and computers uttered this many years ago. For those who can read Chinese, you can read what is written in Chinese. It's used to word. We don't do unto others that others uh, do unto you. Okay. So, so you can also read this in the Bible. You can find uh, excerpts in different parts of the New Testament that evocate this kind of thing. But usually people do. So, we did experiment. So, we have a structure that does not change, but when we switch between these two experiments, we get different skills. So you go through all the mathematics. Okay, the mathematics can be followed quite easily. And finally, you arrive at two reciprocity theorems. One is called the Lorentz reciprocity theorem, where the surface S does not control. And both of and in So you have the first expression, and this reciprocity theorem is used sometimes in wave flat because inside the wave flat, there's no force. We are just surfaces, you know, pop the wave flat into different surfaces and impose this uh, Lorentz reciprocity theorem. 
And then um, you can have the other reciprocity theorem, which is more interesting. And if you have a way of arguing that when a secret surface has to infinity, the left hand side goes to zero. Okay, so it's demonstrated in the lecture notes. Then we have we have this interesting uh, reciprocity theorem, which is kind of indicated in the last slide there. Because of the reactions of the field from experiment two to the sources of experiment one, it equals to the reaction of the field from experiment one to the sources from experiment two. Okay, so this constitutes a form reactions and and you might want to think of them as some kind of a measurement. And you can bring in the concept of measurement quite easily if you let this be point sources. If I make J1 into uh, J into a dipole source, okay? A point source, okay, J1 is a point source and then M is also a point source. I can also make J2 a point source and then M2 into a point source, okay? Then when you do this integration, because they are point sources, you need only to integrate over a point in space. So it becomes the interaction, think of this as interaction. Interactions of the field from experiment two with J1, J1 is just a point four, which means that J1 is trying to measure the field at that particular point in space. So the field, this experiment to measure by the bipole force, J1, and let's not talk about N yet, is equal to the opposite. The field, this experiment one, measured by the bipole force. Okay, so when you think this way, it's quite easy to think that the actual performance is maximum. But in real life, you do not have to measure with a point force. You can, for instance, design a famous that pick up the field very quickly. And famous is not a point source, especially a linear superposition of point source. So this is a very general theorem that applies to a famous theory as well. Later on in the course, we learn more about the theory and how we can apply this reciprocity theorem. And then first, uh, talk this concept previously was the end of the course, and it was closer to describe uh, the theory. So the first version of the lecture was the past. It had a lot of different effects, and we needed them. Okay, so you don't have to worry about the same theory right now. Uh, later on, when we study in China theory, we bring it back to process this year and so we see how we can do this to argue a number of things. So because of that, then um we can show that J1, E is two of one, J2, E1 is J1, E2. Then you can apply this to two and containers driven by point source. Assuming that you have two containers, this is a very tiny point source at the core of this container. Then you can apply this theory, and this terrain can be very, very complicated. This terrain could also be used for surface work when you have to set a computer project. So it can be something very, very complicated. So as long as we can solve the problem in this manner, we can argue that these two are the same. And what is more wonderful is that if you have something like this, you can distill it down to a two-port network. Okay, you have a transmitter here, a receiver here, one is right with a point post here, the other one is right with a point post here, even though they're marked or not. So this will be here as well. Okay? And then you can describe this linear relationship to the two point network. Okay. 
is mind boggling because we never talk about two points. So, two things that are very, very far apart. But then we have a linear. That's what the equation is a linear. We can describe this interaction of these two points as a linear system. So, I, I rewrite and redraw the two, the two previous pixels in terms of a two point network. And this allows you to connect the token theory, and then you can go and apply the action right to the theorem to the support network to be able to show that you want to use it. Because what you have to do there is that you have to open circuit one and then stop circuit the other one, open circuit one and stop circuit the other one, perform a number of matches to the support network. And then you can pick up the value of you want to. Okay, this is very important. Uh, this is very important. What it says is that I was trying to check up our people. Then you want to give it to our people. Unfortunately, it was quite easy. Something that makes it color. Okay, so that was a huge thing already. So it was operating, I think, in the metaphor micro region. So if you're thinking in the control power of that gigantic and then if whatever you do is a bit more compared away, you can apply to the speed. So the management system will affect the rest of the wall. So company to three systems. As long as it's two four, a much much smaller than version, as you just said, okay. And this two four are so much smaller than version, you can apply the opposite equation or the equation in the top of the field as this two four. Later on, we'll talk more about that. I guess this is my slide, okay. But I just have to find. So we did equivalence theorem. Uh, and this, uh, which is something that was first done without mathematics, was done in a way that I was trying to think this is the problem in the left hand side, it's equivalent to the problem in the right hand side. How can you convince you of that? Let's first solve the problem in the left side. To make it a solution to my two applications. And then the input to my two applications are so they enhance the problem I solve the solution. If you know mathematics well enough, you know that those two issues that solve everything one you need to do. Okay. Now let's assume that radiation is this in the credit card. So we found the problem in the left hand side. The radiation condition is that we find the problem on the right hand side. That's what we want to do. Okay. Now I go to the right hand side and construct another proper basis. I construct the solution where it is the same E and H outside, but the field is zero inside. And that's not possible because the field will have a jump from the left The left hand side is the same as the quadrant. The left hand side is satisfying a cross equation as the quadrant. But the right hand side, we have to do something else to make it an experiment. Okay. So we put in this column, survey column, to support this jump to continuity. And we have convinced you that this survey column should be derived from my cross equation in terms of jump. So if I put in this circuit part the right way, then the right hand side also becomes a square and agree. But if I drop the right hand side and the next part equation, next part equation is exactly the same. Okay. So then the right hand solution must be the same as this left hand solution. And if you're not convinced, then you can apply your knowledge of the Nicholas theorem. Argue that the field outside EH must be the same by 
theorem, which means that if they have a big tangential E and for the big tangential X, the much is equal to the theorem. Okay. So one more very interesting thing is that you have this extinction theorem, which says that the theory is like and you can make that happen on paper in your patient. It may not be easy to make it happen in the lab. Very difficult to shuffle all these columns in the lab. So you can do the other case too, which is the outside in case. You just turn things around and you can do things that is a combo for the first two cases. And then you can have other things by putting in a PEC inside the inside region, since there's nothing there. There's no field there, you can fill it with a PEC and now use that. A electric current cannot radiate on top of a perfect electric conductor. The electric current cannot radiate on top of a perfect conductor. So you can take out this electric current now and say that this is the same as this problem. So you have equivalent problems. This problem is all equivalent to each other. We can do the same for PMC. Okay. And you can pick out this magnetic current by the same token. If the electric current cannot radiate on top of the PEC, magnetic current cannot radiate on top of the PMC. Okay. And then the next thing that we say, you can actually prove this not by virtual argument or physical arguments, we can actually prove this as analysis. How can we go about doing that? We have a proof for this using Green's theorem. Okay, Green's theorem, and uh, this S would be actually adopted as okay, it's not clear. It's actually something that you mentioned uh, in a hint. Okay, I asked I asked my student not to convert this picture so that that surface S is actually adopted as something that you can mention in our hint. Well, if you have this thing, then you can go to the mass. Uh, then you can show that the potential, the field of potential that you have, satisfy the first equation. And then the green function satisfy the second equation, multiply the second equation, the first equation by three, the second equation by five, and you subtract them, and you go to the new of the number of factor identity. You arrive at the last equation. The last equation, um, if you dot the i and cross the t, possible you will arrive so that the last equation. Okay. The last equation is exactly what we say in previous work. That inside the region D, there's no field. And they actually follow from the mathematics. That is actually the extinction theorem that we just talked about. The top part of the equation is what we talked about outside. Okay. And it says that the field outside and the, the, the field in D can be written in terms of surface integral of the green function. And the green function is radiating through two kinds of sources. One is a monopole layer source, which is the first term because it's just a simple green function. The second term is a normal derivative of the green function. That is called a dipole layer source. Dipole layer source. And so with this kind of sources, you can actually make the field you know, produce A plus C. This is shown by mathematics, not by physical arguments. So inside B, you would use the field, but outside B, you have no field. And what is math show? And then it's exactly the instant theorem that we talked about. Any questions on this? Okay. So you can kind of distort the surface a little bit so that the surface that enclosed the observation point consists of two surfaces. And again, I like to make the inner surface into a dotted surface. And I let the outer surface go to the same and so that contribution from 
that how the surface is zero. And then you have um, quite a principle the way has been stipulated. Okay, and then you go to the electromagnetic case. Electromagnetic case, unfortunately, is a lot more complicated. You have to work instead of with a scalar wave equation on the right hand side here, you work with a vector wave equation. Instead of working with a scalar green function, you work with a static green function. Okay, and you feel that the static green function is something that's very complicated. I don't know how to make this green function. Okay, so you have to live with this static green function. So you get it. As part of the okay. So you just learn how to do all these things. And then you can prove this identity, and this identity is very similar to the identity that we have for the scale of green function thing, except that everything becomes the identity and vector, and then um, then things will become. Uh, more complicated, more complicated manually in terms of you having to drop this high in process. So conceptually, yeah, the same. Conceptually, they are the same. Okay. So I, I still think I have any more slides. Any questions? We have five more minutes yet. Yeah, I always have to do this just to prove that the vector. Right. It's a lot simpler. I make it a lot simpler for you. Okay. So the third line is a solution to the second line. It'll be a lot harder to derive the third line from the second line. So the next line is simpler for you. You just have to convince you that convince yourself that the third line is a solution to the second line. Next time it should be an all easier one. You can try to write the third line to the second line. Okay. Any other questions? On the previous transparency or this one? Okay, let me see. I had uh, uh, four, two, four, one. This lecture, this is week four, lecture one. What is it on? Lecture four. I have, uh, I have week four, one. Week four. I have two lectures. One and two. Which one is it? Okay. You still have five more minutes, so we can do it in class if you want to. I said you might I want to listen to your question. I don't think it is, but it's like lecture four one. Week uh week lecture week four, lecture one. Okay, let's see what we have for slide two. No, no, we mean week four lecture two. Week four lecture two, right? Okay. Okay, this is week four lecture two. Okay, any any of this sounds familiar? This one will have some force in it. So if you look at this, yeah, if you look at this transfer function, the transfer function in this system is I O D, just Y. Okay, if you look for Y, how do we solve for Y? We all are pro in electrical engineering, so this is J omega C plus one over J omega L. Agree? So H, H is a transfer function. 
uh, which is given by this. I hope I'm doing it correctly. So it will be k uh, omega square L C plus one over j omega L or something like this. So there is a pole here. Maybe this is not a good example. There's only one pole. Okay, if I connect them, it's parallel and it's two poles. So if you have a more complicated circuit, you have more poles. Okay, can you see where the poles come from now? Uh, yeah. The poles? Yeah. The poles are the resonant solution of this system. As we say, this solution is natural solution without a driving pole. Those are the resonant solutions of the natural solution or the homogeneous solution. You can combine and convert this circuit problem into an ODE and then the right hand side will be zero. Then we call it homogeneous solution. So, what does the like the top one? Just equal the like time online? No. No, no. Uh, when you have the transfer function, the transfer function is actually in the frequency domain. And when you're in the frequency domain, there are two ways of looking at it. So if you look at it from electrical engineering, you call it the phasor technique. But if you're a system processor, the professor will want you to take a Fourier transform to the other domain. Okay, so that's true for all things. Or phasor technique, and it's only valid for one thing. But the math is a lot simple. But if you want to solve a circuit problem in general, valid for all frequencies, valid both in the time domain and the frequency domain, you use Fourier transform technique. We can go to the part of the electric mode and the parallel of the Fourier transform technique. They're very similar to each other. So if you were to solve this problem in the Fourier way, you find that that transfer function you have will have poles. And those poles correspond to the resonance solution. Okay, I think I did it correctly. So maybe this is not a good process because it seems to be good. Yeah. So, uh, one is like, what you're trying to say is for a lot of systems, that's what it is. Right. Yeah, for the lofty system, those poles would move away from the rear. Yeah. in the complex. How many of you are people talking? I guess none of you are people talking. You are involved. Okay, so if you solve this problem, you take the processing technique, you go to the Fourier transform. Okay, so you take the Fourier transform technique, you go to the Fourier transform And then you will look for four in the transform function. And if the system has many rational frequencies, you see lots of four in the Fourier system. Okay, and it's not on a main set and stuff. Okay, you can go back and study a more complicated circuit. Uh, this, is, this is something I just thought very quickly. For instance, you might have a circuit that looks like this very complicated lossless. Okay. Uh, you probably learned from the circuit theory that number of elements. I don't remember the rule now. The number of elements you have in the circuit determines the number of poles you have. If you just write out the four equations, and then you have a lot of very complicated circuits, you can have more poles, more references. Okay. So this, in a sense, is an easier way to understand this four thing, right? On the data, you know. okay, so you can go back and revise your signal processing knowledge or your circuit theory knowledge, and then you get better understanding of it. Okay. Is, is it fair? Okay, you can go back. I can talk to you more if you. Thank <laughs> you.
I guess the input we can work out a scheme where if you can show that you understand the next week, we can start to check. Sure, that's anything to help out. I'm more yeah. nervous about uh, like, how it's great. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm still working on that. Okay. 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 